Okay, let's start. Okay, so uh, we have been looking at uh, this two-stage Miller op-amp, and this is the regular two-stage OTA without any compensation. And uh, to compensate this, we decided to go and put a capacitor across the second stage. So once again, let's quickly write the pole zero locations. So can you tell me the DC gain here? GM1 by GM2 by GL prime. What is the first pole approximately? What is the conductance here? G1 capacitance. CC into see I am writing it again and again so that it gets kind of registered in your mind right that's all it's no point so what is the second pole approximately first tell me the total capacitance here we have CL prime and these two guys in parallel so we have CL prime what about the conductance we have GL prime is there and because of uh, this feedback configuration you have something from gm2 as well so it's gl prime plus gm2 times the feedback factor which is this okay. and as we saw if you can ensure c1 to be much smaller than cc and cl and c2 is smaller than cl what does it approximate to huh? gm2 by cl okay. again the logic is we are saying the load capacitance is much higher so the total capacitance here is dominated by the load capacitance and the conductance, you since you assume CC to be small, um, larger than C1, you can treat it like a short at the second pole frequency. So this looks like a resistance of 1 by GM and that's why you get this. And what is the unity loop gain frequency here? Yeah, I mean, how did you, how did we even find for this guy? Yeah, we basically approximated like a first order system. And then we say it's beta A naught times P1 and this you can work out to be this. And even otherwise uh, you can get this unity loop gain frequency qualitatively from the uh, circuit here. See this again based on the observation that around the unity loop gain frequency you are behaving like a first order system. Now you look at the capacitor CL that is contributing to the second pole only. And for a well compensated system, the second pole is occurring before the unity loop gain frequency or after the unity loop gain frequency. After. So we are look interested in a frequency much smaller than the second pole. So what can I say about CL then? I mean CL is contributing to the second pole. We are looking at a frequency much lower than the second pole. So how can I treat CL at that frequency? I can treat it as open. right? And uh, so now you have this current GM1 V in, right? And remember that around the unity loop gain frequency, my transfer function goes as 1 by S, right? Minus 20 dB per decade. So if that is the case, this current, do you think it flows to the resistance here or the capacitances here? I mean, the tra transfer function goes as 1 by S. So the current is gm1 by s, so the voltage should be of the form 1 by s. So the current should flow through the conductance here or the capacitance there? Capacitance. capacitance. And it should also make sense because uh, uh, omega u loop occurs much much greater than your first pole. Right? If you recollect this, your first pole is at very low frequency and this comes. So you are looking at a frequency which is much greater than your first pole, so again this can be ignored. So this current essentially flows completely into this guy because CC is much higher than C1. Okay. So now uh, this is an OTA. Uh, if this is 0, what can you say about this voltage approximately? It's a negative feedback. Right? Roughly 0. So now you see uh, this is my output. This is 0. So what is V out of this? What is it? The current is minus GM1 V in. 
into 1 by FCC. Right? So, what is the transfer function? V out by V in what is the ratio? Yeah. So, so what is the unity gain frequency? J1 by CC. That's one way in which you can say. So around the unity loop gain frequency, this current basically flows through the capacitance here and generates the voltage like this. Okay. And here we know that we have a uh, right off plane uh, zero. And in the last class, we saw one simple way to eliminate that zero is to actually go and put a small resistor in series with the capacitor. And you choose the value of the resistor to be exactly 1 by gm2, mm -hmm. then the zero moves to infinite frequency. Right? So this is typically done to eliminate the effect of uh, the RHP zero. Right. So that's uh, mainly about Miller compensation. So now if you recollect, when we started this discussion on stability, we came up with two solutions to stabilize our two state, I mean uh, our system. One was to essentially keep the open loop poles far apart like this. And what was the second idea? We decided to add an LHP zero like this, right? So that if you don't do anything, the closed loop poles do this, but with the LHP zero, it kind of falls back. So Miller compensation kind of uh, did this, it ensured that the poles were far apart, right? And again, uh, if I had to give the analogy, it's like two naughty kids in the class, you don't want to keep them close by. So in a classroom, you keep them apart so that stability is maintained. That is the idea of Miller compensation. In this guy, you make sure that the two naughty kids are seated close to each other, but you make sure there is a strict adult nearby them so that they are well behaved, right? And this is the uh, second thing. Let's actually try to see how we can do this. So this is the two-stage OTA. Okay. So now uh, my goal is to go and add a left-off plane zero in the circuit, right? So can you suggest me some way to do this? Zero can be added. Like, hmm? uh, there is a yeah, see, the, if you recollect, we saw that zero typically arises if we have the output obtained as sum of two voltages, or at the output we have two different currents getting added. Here, if you see the at the output we have current pumped in by this GM block. So, the simplest way here to, is to add another current. And we should make sure the uh, phase shifts between the two are not the same, right? That's all. And here you already see that the current uh, GM2 pumps in is proportional to V in, but this has a phase shift because of this capacitance here. So if we can somehow add another current proportional to V in, add it at the output, which does not contain any delay, then we are set. And we need to basically that means that we have to sense this voltage, pump in a current proportional to that voltage. What block does that? Huh? It's a OTA, it's a voltage control current source. We have to sense this voltage and push in a current proportional to that voltage. That's what Okay, good point. So two things. Uh, one is which means you have to basically take the difference here somehow and then put a resistor there. But the issue is even if I do this, the resistor is not only going to ensure this conduction, <coughs> it will also kind of conduct in the opposite way, right? Okay. Yeah, that kind of changes things. Okay. Sim I mean, we the point is we only want a feed forward path, so that's better than with a transconductor, right? Yeah, I mean, basically now the question is, we have current flowing in one branch. I have one more current. How do we add the two currents? 
no i mean simple i mean you have two wires okay each wire i mean first wire carries i1 second wire carries i2 i want current i1 plus i2 <coughs> what is the simplest thing i can do so is, is, is that the question no like if the uh, add a transistor uh, which has a latency of 2 days of b and b correct correct so if uh, add a current into there yeah ah that's uh, gm right oh, okay i mean uh, that's a transconductor Yeah. See, the thing is, you are saying why don't you just do it? But remember, this is basically a single input case. You can't apply two inputs like this, right? Be because here it is a high input impedance, here it is a low input impedance. So once again, that will give rise to the fact that you need to put a buffer. You put V2 here and take it here, and that's a defect. Right? If you want to sense one voltage and pump in a current proportional to it, common source works. here you want to sense the difference between two voltages so you have to use a defab so it is all at a block level it's a transconductor right i mean how you are implementing the transconductor is up to you okay so what i'll do is i'll sense the same voltage and basically pump in a current here. Okay. and let's call it gm3 so now this third gm will have so we will see like Voltage of the terminal, or it is the difference between between these two. Between these two, right? It's a differential amplifier. But anyway, like we are, we will be connecting one of those terminals in the neg negative field. Right? Yeah, yeah. But the point is, uh, the in the op amp as such, whatever you have, it works based on the difference between these two. I mean, even if you put it in feedback like this, the uh, function of the op amp is to provide a voltage here that is proportional to the difference between these two. That doesn't change. Pump in a current proportional to the difference between. Yeah. Okay. Is that clear? So now we have added the third GM, so that will have its own uh, output conductance, capacitance, etc. So if you keep adding that, actually, let me reduce the space here. so we'll basically have uh, let's say i call this g2 and c2 that is the conductance capacitance of second stage alone now we'll have g3 c3 and on top of it i'll have the uh, load conductance capacitance also so everything will come in parallel like this fine Issue with the previous transistor raises to add. Okay. Uh, the question was, why don't you just use a single transistor like this? Is that the? Yeah, no. Ah. Uh, we added this GM three. Right? Correct. So the motivation behind. Okay. You understood that we need to add a left top plane zero, ah. and we saw typically zero comes if we have two currents with different phase shifts getting added at the output. That means. Right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. That's that's where I'm coming at now. So now I haven't decided the signs of the OT8 GM3. How do you think I'll decide it? GM2 will take in some current. I mean, assume that it's all very high output resistance, so currents just don't go. Into it. I mean, basically, see, the output resistance are all lumped here, right? Okay. So if I just look at these two currents, they'll add here and flow through the effective output. That's all. That current is zero, right? Which current? That current is zero. Correct. No, no. The question is, yeah, yeah. That is all correct. But how do I choose the signs of this voltage? You know. You need to choose such that the currents add up to zero. No, I mean that you. That I mean zero adds up at some frequency dependent on the component values. Now I'm just talking which is plus, which is minus. So okay, first of all, do you want the zero in the left half plane or right half plane? Left half plane. Left half plane. So which means if you think about it, if I do the calculation of zero, the first branch is going to give me some current, which will have some S times something times V in, right? And the second branch will give me something times V in. Both should add with the same sign. Only then the S will be in the left half of S plane. 
right basically the signs of the two currents should be same that's all so here uh, the current here is negative or positive negative because here you see it's connected to the inverting terminal so then this should be negative or positive okay. so this should also be negative okay so now you see that the current getting pumped here sorry by the transistor transconductor gm2 is negative because it is applied to the inverting terminal so this current is also negative that's it And I mean, even if you think about our uh, Miller OT, right? So there we had an RHP zero. Maybe I'll put it here. And that zero was in the right half plane because if you think here, the current through the capacitor, if I call this voltage as V one, this was positive. Whereas the current through the transconductor, it was minus GM two V one, right? So the capacitor was pumping in a current which is V1 times SCC. This guy was minus GM2 times V1, and that's why it had it in the right half plane. So if you want to have it in the left half plane, you better have the polarities to be same for the two summing paths. Okay. So if we use a resistor, then our right half will be positive. Okay, I'll give this an exercise now. <laughs> you can think. I mean, there is nothing wrong in it, but you just have to make sure others other things don't get affected. That's all. Okay, think about it. Again, I'll give that as an exercise uh, with the right reasoning. Hmm? So let me now label this, and again, I'll not show all the resistance conductance. I'll lump everything as usual. I'll say it's GL prime and CL prime. Okay. As usual, GL prime comprises of G two, G three, and GL. CL prime comprises of these three. Great. So this is called the feed forward compensation for obvious reasons because you are adding a feed forward path to introduce the left half plane zero. Great. So yeah, I mean. Uh, You guys know how this kind of helps to stabilize in the frequency domain from the pole zero locations. It's also good to understand how this helps to stabilize in time domain because that gives a different perspective altogether. So let us say I put this guy in negative feedback like this, and I apply a step here. Let us say, okay. and let us say initially I don't have this feed forward path. It is your regular two-stage OTA without anything. You know that uh, we have two poles here, and each pole is going to contribute to a time delay, and we have more time delay, so the system in closed loop will not be that stable. We already saw that. So now what we are doing is we are adding this feed-forward path. So moment I change the input here, so this guy is going to have a lot of delay. but this guy will respond quickly because you see that we have bypassed this delay completely right so whenever you see a sudden change in the input this guy is the one who will respond first and this will typically call as the fast path so the fast path will respond quickly and it will give a quick and dirty estimate i'm calling it quick because it is fast obviously i'm calling the estimate dirty because if i just have the fast path alone what can you say about the dc gain of this gm3 i mean that is much smaller than the dc gain of the two stage right so if i just have the fast path alone it is not accurate because the dc gain is small so it gives a, a reasonably okayish estimate but its job is to just give a quick estimate so since the output will start to respond quickly the feedback will be functional and after some time the slow path will start to respond and since it has a high dc gain it finally makes sure that the output settles to the required accuracy so this guy is the slow but accurate path
okay so what it will do is whenever you see a uh, change in the input this fast path will make sure that the output goes in the correct direction if the output has to go positive it will rise positive and vice versa so depends now how uh, depends on how fast this is responding and stuff we'll see the condition but at least qualitatively it should make sense we'll see the more conditions later so here we can connect positive terminal of gm1 to the output but you check if it's a negative feedback right from here to here this is thing is negative because you have the inversion from the second stage isn't it great right? and i mean even if you recollect when we uh, looked at the effect of zeros in time domain when we had a first order system like this we saw that when we introduced the zero when i applied a step the output jumped up instantaneously and then did this right and i mean here it happened because uh, there it was a first order system and you are adding <coughs> uh, one zero here the output will not jump up instantly because we have two poles and only one zero okay <clears throat> but the output will increase faster in the correct direction so usually you will find if you have same number of poles and zeros <coughs> if you apply a step at the input the output will jump up instantly and that is kind of giving the time advance okay. if you have lesser number of zeros than the poles then you won't see this instantaneous jump but you will still see a fast rising initially is it okay again this strategy is not that you know new i mean if you follow cricket in t20 sometimes if let us say a team has to chase a large target sometimes they send in some guy in the top order so that that guy will just come and hit fours and sixes he is not a proper batsman his job is to just score runs quickly so that run rate increases he will get out after two hours but the run rate will be very high then the proper batsman will come and make sure that the final target is reached it's the same strategy and how do you think they got this idea they took 613 okay so can this zero cancel any of the poles mm we'll see it is in principle you should be able to do i think the will do already critically done we can see we'll see the rotation of poles and zeros then you'll be able to take a call if you can do that right in principle you should be but it is not that easy that's all cool so now we have this let's look at the location of poles and zeros i'll erase this so first of all uh, tell me the dc gain here let me actually put that here yeah what do you think is the dc gain or first tell me what is this voltage v1 at dc gm1 okay so what is the current coming out of the transconductor gm2 hmm so basically minus gm1 by g1 fine what is the current pumped out of the transconductor gm3 minus gm3 v in so this is the total current flowing here at dc where will the current flow to so what is the output that's all so the gain is basically this now right i'll not show the negative i mean we know it's all fine so it's this. this is the dc gain approximately i mean this is the dc gain exactly <laughs> how can i approximate this <coughs> here you see you have gain of two things in product here you just have one term i can basically approximate as the first term alone right so dc gain is approximately same thing it's a product of the dc gain of the two stages so same two stage ota dc gain is same the gm3 is just adding a fast path to compensate and uh, how many poles we have here two poles where are the pole locations same right i mean again for pole locations you assume v in is zero if i zero the input gm1 is not pumping any current gm3 is not pumping any current 
you just have two rc sections which are completely uncoupled so the poles are exactly at g1 by c1 and then so do you have a zero here you can see if i short this guy the output is still not zero so we have a zero and uh, we better have a zero because that's what we wanted also so let's quickly find the location of zero uh, so as usual i'll assume the v out of s is zero so tell me what is uh, v1 first v1 of s the current coming out here is what g1 v in that flows into this parallel combination so what is v1 this is the current it has to flow through the parallel combination of g1 and c1 right so what is the current coming out of the transconductor gm2 yeah this times okay you will basically erase this and directly write it as okay and the current coming out of gm3 is minus at zero frequency some of these two must be i mean i'm taking the sum of these two currents this must be equal to zero so you again uh, you we can take v in of s common you know v in is not zero so the other term must be zero so i'll just say the result it's a simple algebra i think uh, it should come as gm1 gm2 plus gm3 g1 by gm3 c okay take it right so how can i approximate this further as i have gm1 gm2 and gm3 g1 among these two which will dominate first one because that is product of two trans conductances here you have the output conductance that's typically small so the zero is approximately gm1 gm2 by gm3 times c1 okay so cool so now once we know these locations let's uh, sketch the bode plot roughly and then see how things are looking and then move forward <coughs> so let me sketch this let's say omega and this is the magnitude of loop gain so we have some dc gain so beta a not and then we have two poles let us say first pole is here second pole is here and then oops let's say the zero comes this is first pole second pole zero and this is your unity loop gain frequency <coughs> similarly if i sketch the phase so we have two poles so uh, the phase will start from zero and because of the two poles where will the phase go to minus 180 so let's assume it goes to minus 180 and then the zero is there so that will bring the phase up it's not drawn to scale but this is so around omega u loop this is your phase margin just a qualitative sketch so from here you can clearly see uh, if i have to make sure that my system has sufficient phase margin how should the zero be with respect to the unity loop gain frequency should it be lower than the unity loop gain frequency greater than the unity loop gain frequency it should be much lower so if it's much i mean how lower it is this determines the phase margin also so let's uh, find out the phase margin and to find the phase margin what is the first thing i have to find the unity loop gain frequency so let's do that and for that let me write the transfer function i have a of s as a not into one left of plane zero and two left of plane poles so the loop gain is beta times this 
to find the omega u loop you put s as j omega find the magnitude equate it to 1 so you get a long equation so once again the mathematician inside you will feel happy but the engineer in you feel sh should feel ashamed right so how do you think we can approximate this as okay see i know that my omega u loop is going to occur at a much higher frequency than all these three guys again i am assuming it is well stable which means the unity loop gain frequency has to occur much greater than these three frequencies so i am looking at a value of s that is greater than p1 p2 and z1 right so if s is much greater than z1 how can i approximate this numerator as s by z1 similarly what about the denominator that will be s by p1 yeah s by p2 so this you do it you get beta a naught into p1 to p2 by z1 into 1 by s so what is the unity gain frequency now this should be here this so now we can substitute and uh, get the values but i will also give a qualitative explanation as how you can do that so let me copy yeah let me copy this guy see uh, once again the observation we make is the following the unity loop gain frequency is occurring much greater than both the poles right and remember the first pole is at g1 by c1 right so since my unity loop gain frequency is occurring much greater than the uh, pole location around the unity loop gain frequency what can i say about c1 short i am looking at a frequency much greater than this pole location so i can treat c1 like a short so what can you say about the current coming out of gm2 zero so which means this guy is not playing any role i can erase it fine it is not pumping any current so it's as good as open and you look gm1 gm1 is pumping current into the current from here is going to short so this is also not relevant so what is finally relevant yeah so now here what is the transfer function gm3 by gl prime plus scl prime so it is a first order system that's what you expect around the unity loop gain frequency it is a first order system so what is the omega u here it's a first order system the unity gain frequency is how do you find it no no first order yeah. yeah i mean okay i'm not looking at loop gain so beta is not there so it's just dc gain times the first pole dc gain here is what and what is the first pole fine so what is the omega u so now if you take the loop gain the feedback factor also comes in so the unity loop gain frequency will be beta times this yeah we should that should be the case right yeah because again the logic is around here it should behave like a first order system if you already have two poles to cancel the effect of one of the poles you should have the zero well before it uh, oh okay you are saying uh, you are saying the p1 comes first z1 no then omega u loop no if p1 and then omega u loop is it So if that is the case, you don't even have to compensate, right? You are saying that my P1 comes and then omega U loop comes and then second pole comes, so you add the zero. In this case, you don't need compensation at all, isn't it? We are doing compensation because the two poles are not so far apart. Your assumption is P1 is much greater than P2 here. Okay. So typically, this will be the case. So you add a zero. before your gain crosses to unity 
and you get it and as we just saw around the unity uh, gain frequency it behaves like a first order system like this and this should also make sense because again see uh, around the unity gain i mean uh, if you think about it the unity loop gain frequency or omega u loosely speaks loosely gives information about how fast the system is responding right now in our feed forward op amp we had two paths so the fastness of the loop should be determined by which path fast path so that's why this is determined the omega u loop or the unity gain frequency determines the speed of the op amp right so what should set the speed of the op amp should be the fast path in your circuit so it also makes sense that this fast path is what is responsible for the unity gain frequency i mean other way to think is we know that at t equal to 0 plus whenever i apply an input let us say at t equal to 0 plus the response will come only from the fast path right now my omega u loop is a very high frequency typically so i'm looking at high frequencies corresponding to instantaneous changes at that point it is the fast path that is going to contribute is it okay the point is it is this path that will determine the speed of the final ota that's all because this is this is the fastest path in your circuit cool okay so now we have this so this is basically let me copy this so what i'll do yeah i know my unity loop gain frequency uh, that is beta times gm3 by cl prime so now let's find the phase margin if i find the loop gain at the phase of the loop gain at this frequency mm -hmm. now you see that the two poles are occurring much earlier than your unity loop gain frequency so what can you say about the phase added by the two poles it almost reaches Minus one eighty, okay. So this around minus one eighty, and the zero will add omega u loop by v one. So what is the phase margin? Tan inverse of the and as we expected, the lower the zero is with respect to the unity loop gain frequency, phase margin is also equally higher. So now we have uh, this information. Let's so which means you can go and design for any phase margin you want. Okay, but now we have Miller compensation and the feed forward compensation. So let's try to get some differences between the two. So first, let me look at feed forward compensation. So I'll quickly sketch the block. So this is two stage, and then you add a. feed forward path here so what is the unity loop gain frequency here it is set by the fast path which is gm3 so beta gm3 by cl prime and the zero i'll write it it's gm1 gm2 by gm3 times c1 that this is c1 and the phase margin we just saw this to be tan inverse of omega u loop by z1 okay so now let us say yeah so which means my z1 will be omega u loop right can okay, i am just rewriting the same thing so now let's also look at uh, the case of miller so here we added the capacitor and let's assume we have the zero cancelling resistor also so what is the unity loop gain frequency here i can remember that the current here flows to only to the capacitor so the unity gain frequency is beta times okay and what is the second pole approximately gm2 by cl prime i'll just say it's cl and what is the phase margin here 
the first pole what is the face it contributes 90 so that gives 90 and then you just have the second pole we have assumed that the zero is cancelled and the third pole that we have we are ignoring it okay so now here this again you can simplify it like this i'll just write the thing the simple rearranging right again here it should make sense because in your miller op amp miller op amp the second pole must be further away from your unity log gain frequency to get a good phase margin so higher the phase margin farther should p to b from your loop gain unity log gain frequency okay so now let us say uh, you have designed uh, let us say design for a phase margin of 60 degrees right so then where is z1 with respect to unity log gain frequency what is tan 60 okay so here where is p2 with respect to the unity log gain frequency times root 3 so let us say i have designed both op amps for the same phase margin and the same unity log gain frequency and let's assume that your uh, specification changes let's say you change your mind or your manager becomes crazy and says that hey now i want a phase margin of 76 degrees now where should the new zero location change tan of 76 no what tan 76 is okay it's 4 roughly okay. so here this should be at 4 times so now if i see here my pole second pole was at some frequency before now to increase the phase margin i have to go and push it further away and my second pole is at gm2 by cl so to push my second pole further away what should i do i have to only increase gm2 that's the only solution so which means i have to increase gm2 which means power will also increase fine now let's come back to feed forward here to increase the phase margin i just have to push the zero to a lower frequency now this is the location of the zero now can you suggest me a technique to reduce the zero location okay if i increase gm3 what happens to unity gain frequency that also changes so what is one simple thing you can do i mean yeah okay okay you can decrease gm1 gm2 but even simpler is i can increase c1 how do i increase c1 you just go and put a capacitor there intentionally that's a simple thing you can do right just put a capacitor there the zero moves to a low frequency and almost for free you are getting the higher phase margin right so that is one nice thing so typically you will find that feed forward consumes relatively lower power for the same speed by speed i mean the unity gain frequency and phase margin see here also it uh, you are increasing gm2 so but uh, the issue with the feed forward is the following let me just see if i have the schematic somewhere yeah so this point is clear so improving the phase margin of feed forward is relatively easier it doesn't take lot of power okay so speed means omega u loop yeah yeah speed this means omega u loop remember that the unity loop gain frequency sets the closed loop 3db bandwidth approximately right so that kind of is the speed right so one issue with feed forward op amp is the following so let us say once again i put it in unity feedback like this i apply a step and let us say that the op amp has an effective dc gain of some a not i apply a step so the configuration is this now okay it's put in unity feedback i apply a step and this has a gain of a not so my output will start from zero 
and as t tends to infinity where will the output settle to yeah but i mean uh, the dc gain is only a naught so what will be the steady state value it will reach i mean remember that this is something like this right you have a gain of a naught you are applying a step what will be the output steady state It's a naught by one plus a naught. If the gain is infinity, it will exactly reach one. Else, it is going to reach this value, right? But when I apply this step, at that instant, which of these two paths will respond? The GM three path will respond. So initially, you will have the uh, output rising due to only the fast path. And let us say I have only the fast path. The DC gain of that will be what? GM three by some GL prime. That is going to be let us say some A one. That is smaller than A naught. If I only have the fast path, let us say the output will settle to this value. Right. But I have also the slow path. So after some time, say the slow path picks up, and then. this is what typically happens now to improve the stability we saw we can go and increase the capacitance one or the other options where you can reduce gm1 or gm2 or both right so if i increase c1 or reduce gm1 and gm2 basically what can you say about this path we are making it slower right so now to uh, the uh, to improve the phase margin you are basically making this faster and this very slower and if you have a combination of this very fast path and very slow path what can happen is the slow path will take forever to reach the final value okay right and i can show some simulation results without getting into a lot of explanation so what i did is the following i took uh, Feed forward compensated op amp. So this is the DC gain around thousand. So the unity gain frequency is this nine point two mega radians per second, somewhere here, and the phase margin here is around seventy. Okay, as you expect, the phase goes to around drops and then increases later. So then I took another system, which is Miller compensated. Also has the same DC gain, same unity gain frequency. Okay, phase margin is slightly worse. Okay, roughly same though. And I do the same experiment. I took each of them and put them in unity feedback. Apply a step, right? And this is the step response. So first look at this. This is a zoomed-in version of this. and the yellow one is the miller compensation uh, blue is the feed forward so as you see uh, with the feed forward because of the fast path the response is quicker initially right that is kind of expected this is initially when you when you when you apply the step but if you look at the steady state the miller the miller compensated op amp has reached the steady state much quicker that is this guy is taking forever it depends on actual location of zeros since you have zeros here the it is no longer a conventional second order system like you do like you know you also have some z here right so that kind of changes the step process but the gain of the fast path because of the gain of the fast path the value that it will settle will be lower than the actual. correct right. the thing is now what will happen the slow path will start to kick in but the since the uh, slow path is slower the feedback doesn't know that the output has reached it you know this is same thing as having lot of delay in your feedback right so now what happens is the following we have a slow path and a fast path the fast path is bringing the output close to the required value then the slow path kicks in it is further increasing but now only this path is responding so which means when you put it in feedback the output will keep increasing but since this guy is responding slow 
it will be responding to an input applied slightly earlier so the feedback loop will be oblivious to the fact that the output has reached the required value so it can actually overshoot it's because you have the slower path to be very slow right? but why is it like the uh, traditional value for the uh, fast path is lesser than the slow yeah yeah correct uh, fast path would have stopped responding around that time right for example here let us say the fast path job is completed here somewhere let us say from here it is the job of the slow path to set the output to close to 1 but the point is since the feedback is now predominantly uh, dominated by the slow path the output will increase but the slow path will take longer time to respond which means let us say at this point the slow path will be responding to an input applied somewhere here yeah so by the time it overshoots here you spend it recognize that hey i have already exceeded the output then it tries to reduce it and then does it i mean again the analogy i gave is this mixing of hot water cold water right so if you don't do it correctly you might not settle quickly and you can actually if i zoom in this plot and plot it in log scale <coughs> so that i see the minor differences clearly here you can clearly see the miller guy has settled quickly but the feed forward is taking very very long so that is one minor issue with feed forward which is uh the settling will be slower so miller is actually good if you want to have a very fast and accurate settling but sometimes you will find that uh, to design a very high speed op amp the power consumption in the miller op amp might be so much that you will be, you are better off with the feed forward so usually very high speed op amps people prefer to use feed forward because the power consumption is very small okay so there are more chances of bringing in feed forward right not necessarily the, 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 you can have a case like this where like if i design for a phase margin of same that omega you do if you have the, the thing is if you design for a smaller phase margin mm -hmm. then the slow path will not be very slow right here the issue is to increase the phase margin you are making this slower okay. that is why that slight overshoot happens and very slow settling happens so that overshoot won't happen for, for mm, i cannot comment exactly right but i would say if you, you are designing for a smaller phase margin of 60 degrees then this is not that slow right because there you want to have the zero to be at because the miller thing will definitely overshoot here for 60 degree yeah but uh, this thing will also overshoot it may or may not yeah i mean i, I cannot say you have to check okay there is one other difference maybe i'll give that as exercise so i'll just make the statement and i'll make you uh, you know let you prove it so in a miller op amp if you change the feedback factor beta i mean typically you want the uh, feedback factor to be greater than 1 or smaller than 1 why greater than 1 so that another unit is uh okay but let's say remember that the feedback factor is basically determined by the the final application so here what is the closed loop transfer function huh yeah 1 by beta times loop gain by 1 plus loop gain you want this to get some i mean you want to finally realize some amplification and you want that amplification factor to be exact and that is why we are doing negative feedback right so beta is typically typically less than 1 i'm not saying all this but typically less than 1 so which means for a miller op amp let us say you keep reducing beta you will find that phase margin actually improves so beta equal to 1 is the worst case feedback factor whereas that is not the case for uh, feed forward okay so i'll give that as a problem to work out so the uh, so the yeah you can from the you, uh, basically you plot the loop gain that was like the zero can 
Yeah, okay, here I can quickly show, right? So here if I reduce the feedback factor beta, what happens? What changes? Phase plot, what happens to the phase plot? Phase plot doesn't change. The magnitude plot changes. So let us say I change the, this guy. Right? So now it is somewhere here. The phase margin is very poor. Okay. But for a miller op you will find since the phase is continuously dropping, you can quickly show, right? No, it's not taking a lot of time. So for a Miller case, you have something like this. The phase is also continuously dropping. So let us say now this is your phase. If I scale the magnitude plot, your phase margin will be better. So which means if you are designing a general purpose op -amp, you can design a Miller op -amp and say that for feedback factor of one, so much is my phase margin then the customer can use it for any feedback factor and they'll be fine. We can't make a general purpose op amp with feed forward. For application specific requirements, you can design. If you know what is the feedback factor you are going to use it for, you can actually design a feed forward. Okay. So I'll stop here. I've fixed it a lot of time.